with our new conifer border as a backdrop to the perennial bed that Adrian Bloom helped us install just last year, you're now getting new vistas that you've never had before. Up against this sergeant's weeping hemlock, for example, is this gorgeous stand of cat mint. There's our resident cat, Frank. This is Nepeta, called Walker's Low, although it's certainly not a very low-growing clump. And if I tiptoe over here, past the last of the oriental poppies, we get around this handsome flowering geranium. There's something I want to show you just on the other side of the bed. Foliage is every bit as important as flowers in a well-designed perennial border. For the plants are going to be out of bloom much longer than they'll be in flower. And I think in this small area, you can see all the principles of good foliage selection. Take, for example, the soft, furry leaves of lamb's ears. And here, they are contrasted with the sharp, bristly, spiky, thistle-like ones of Eryngium. Right next door, three spiky plants of different sizes. The first, this blue fescue grass. Behind it, an iris, iris pallida. But this is the striped variegated one. And that same stripe is picked up in the taller but thinner-leaved Miscanthus sinensis morning light, appropriately named for this time of day. And boy, this is the season for geranium. Just take a look at the light on those lovely purple-blue geranium brookside. The only thing that can beat that right now, however, is this campanula. It's campanula persistifolia. It's a European native, a very easy-to-grow perennial. This selection is called Chettle Charm. Lovely white. And just look at the number of buds we are going to have in the days to come while this is its moment of glory. Hello, I'm Roger Swain, and welcome again to the Victory Garden. Well, today, Bob Smouth takes a look at organic farming at Fairview Gardens in Goleta, California. Back here, I'll be looking at all kinds of vines, and Chef Marion cooks up roasted green beans with red onions. It's a great show. Don't go away. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by... At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful. Lawns greener, trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. And by... State Farm Insurance. Keeping our promise of protection to generation after generation. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Here in our bramble patch, we have an assortment of blackberries, red raspberries, and black raspberries. Now, the first two, the blackberries and the red raspberries, reproduce by sending up new canes each year from underground roots. And you, here you can see the so-called suckers. These are the canes that will grow all summer long, and next year, they will flower and make fruit. In order to keep this bed tidy, we'll root out most of those canes that are out in the aisles. But our black raspberries, they reproduce by a different technique. They, too, produce canes one year that fruit the next. But the canes are much, much larger. Take a look at this cane, for example. It's less than a third grown. It's going to keep growing up eight 10, 12 feet, so long that it eventually tips over under its own weight and lands right down here in the lawn. And when it touches the lawn in the fall, it's going to send roots right out of the stem that anchor it to the lawn. And this is going to be the location of a new black raspberry plant next year. This jumping style allows black raspberry to cover monstrous areas very quickly. Well, obviously, we want to keep it confined. We also want good fruit production. And the way we do that is with a technique called tipping that applies only to black raspberries. You select new growth when it reaches a height of about three feet, and with a pair of pruning shears, simply nip off 
the top three or four inches. Now that looks drastic and you think, gosh, it's not gonna do any more growing. Well, actually it is. It's going to send out side branches at each of these nodes. And those side branches are gonna grow long and next year it's those side branches that are going to bear. As you can see here, there's where I tipped it. I tipped it a little late last year. It was a little taller than it should have been, but I tipped it. These side branches came out, they bloomed, and there are the young black raspberry fruits. And mm -mm, it won't be long before we're picking them. And on the subject of fruit, let's have a look at the apples. This Liberty apple tree has been bred to be disease resistant. You don't have to spray for disease. We do have to spray for insects, and we also have to do some thinning of the fruit. I've got too much fruit on the end of this small branch. The rule of thumb is it takes about 30 or 35 leaves to ripen an apple. With this many apples trying to ripen them up, the tree would exhaust itself. Furthermore, the branch would be so heavy, it would bend down and probably break. So what I do when the fruit is this size is come in and thin it out. First of all, I remove the smallest fruits. They simply get popped out. And any that are blemished, See that crescent-shaped scar there? That's plum curculio damage. Despite our spray, it managed to get attacked, so off it comes. I'm going to take that little one out. I'll leave just one there, one there. I'll probably take that out. Eight inches apart on the branch is a good distance. Now that takes care of thinning. It will guarantee a good fruit set next year. But let's see how our apple maggot control is doing. This red ball, it's a croquet ball, painted a dark red, has been coated with a very sticky glue. It's an insect trapping adhesive. And the apple maggot fly that is laying its eggs on the young apples whose, and its larvae will tunnel through the fruit, is attracted maximally to these red spheres. And they land, intending to lay their eggs, get stuck and die. Now, I see a number of very small little gnats on here, but I don't see the little black fly with the striped wings that the apple maggot is, but I expect it will show up in a few weeks. July and August are its prime time. But what I like about this technique is it's 100% organic insect control. No need to spray for apple maggots when you have two or three balls hung at head height on a semi-dwarf tree of this size. And speaking of organic techniques, let's join Bob Smouse. He's out in Goleta, California, where he's discovered a truck farm that provides organic produce to its customers. Have a look. Hi, I'm Bob Smouse, and today I'm in Goleta, California, on some of the most expensive real estate in the state. But somehow, Michael Abelman has managed to turn this into a truck farm. Michael, how'd you do it? Well, I didn't do it by myself. This land was valued by the local community as an anchor to its uh, agricultural roots. And through uh, setting up a conservation easement and placing it on the title of this land, this piece of land has been pr uh, preserved in perpetuity forever. And, and on it, you're managing to grow all sorts of things. Show me some yeah. of the crops. Yeah, we're growing 100 different fruits and vegetables on this land. Wow, that's we're impressive. We're now uh, walking into our uh, Cherimoya orchard, which uh, at one time was a uh, parking area, parking lot for um, equipment, and now is one of the most fertile um, you can see what was ground that was as hard as a rock is now a beautiful, rich soil. That's Producing good. a uh, crop of cherimoyas, which is a subtropical fruit, uh, which uh, has an interior flesh like a very cream color, like the mixture between a banana, papaya, mango, peach, all wrapped up in one. Do you find a good market for that? I thought people have always been a little resistant to Well, cherimoyas. they're resistant <laughs> because they're kind of expensive, and the reason they're expensive is that the cherimoya has a very long uh, uh, bloom, and there is no insect in this part of the world that has a long enough proboscis to pollinate it, so we have to do it by hand with a little paintbrush. Here's a nice large one here. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, Michael, this is a big operation. How many people does it take to run it? It takes about 20 people to uh, run this place, and uh, they are involved with uh, everything from working in the fields to um, growing the crops to marketing. Uh, we have, uh, we do several farmers markets per week. We have a retail stand. We have a number of uh, ways that we uh, distribute our food. Now these what's are, this citrus here? These are uh, clementine mandarins. Uh, there's a few left. This is a winter crop. In fact, this three quarters of an acre produces uh, 
almost $36,000 worth of income um, every winter for us. So it's a very... Uh, just from the mandarins? Just from this block of mandarins. It's a very important part of our uh, winter income. It keeps us going through the winter months. That's so, great. Yeah. Well, Michael, this is a real dream farm. I wouldn't mind to spread like this myself. You've got a little of everything here. What's this? This is our uh, propagation area. This is the shade house, which is, uh, of course, very important in a hot climate. The shade is more important than a greenhouse. It's also very important because it's a way of maximizing a very small piece of land by starting all of our crops in little cells. We are getting a jump on the, the fields while the crops in the fields are completing themselves. What is the smell I'm picking up in here? Uh, there's a little bit of uh, fish and seaweed mixed in with the water that Tom's putting on the plants there. Nice. So you can't depend on others to do this for you? Uh, this is a really critical and very detailed and particular part of what we do, so we have to do it ourselves in-house here. Yeah. Uh, here I see a farmer's best friend, a whole field of black plastic. What's hiding underneath? Well, I don't actually like uh, using black plastic that much, but in this case, it's actually very important to us because underneath this recycled black plastic, it's got a few years on it, is a real surprise, and I'm going to show you. Uh. Here are white asparagus. Go ahead, Bob, try one. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah, they're delicious. Now, these are one of those items we grow because they produce an incredible amount of income on a very small space. And, in fact, there are items like this that support the broccoli and the carrots and the beets. Yeah, those need some help. <laughs> and um, very unusual to find white asparagus in this part of the world. Very, well, in very... Europe, don't they cover this all with soil and then uh, dig them out with special knives and things? That's correct. Normally, it's done in Europe with uh, soil, but it's a little too energy intensive for our needs. Black here, plastic so. works great. Well, Michael, here's a bit of a surprise. A big, boisterous plant, plant like the artichoke that only produces a little teeny fruit taking up all this space in an organic farm. Well, this crop is actually a real important one to us. It fits well in the climate because it doesn't uh, really require a lot of water. People like the chokes we produce because we pick them, unlike those great big ones, we pick them small, and there's no choke, and virtually the whole uh, leaf is edible. And in addition, the artichoke grows as a flower bud straight up in the air and in commercial fields in order to control the plume moth. This is sprayed sometimes every week to 10 days with things like, well, it used to be parathion. I don't know what they use now. Uh, that material just sits in there because it's like a little cup and eventually soaks into the heart. And if you eat it, possibly into your heart. Well, what do you do to avoid spraying? Well, we plant in smaller blocks and we also rotate our plantings uh, every year. It's probably kinder to the land as well. <laughs> That's correct. You know, I'm a coastal gardener myself, and I've got to say I'm very surprised to see so many peach trees right here by the beach. It's really uh, extremely unusual to find a commercial deciduous fruit orchard along the coast. Uh, and over the years, we uh, had to experiment and trial and error a number of uh, varieties that would, would work in this climate. Primarily what we've come up with is low chill varieties, which are varieties that uh, don't require that many uh, hours below 40 degrees in the wintertime. And you manage to grow all of these organically as well? We do. Uh, you know, the, the real foundation for all of our production here is in a really healthy soil, and it, it seems like everything follows from there. But in this case, with the peaches and nectarines specifically, we've had to deal with a little uh, pest called the oriental fruit moth, which lays its eggs and hatches a worm that goes into the fruit. We found a very creative way to do that, which was uh, developed, which is called a confusion lure. You can see it here. It looks like a little twist tie that you put up in the trees, and it um, actually confuses the mating of the moths so that the eggs are, are not viable when they're, they're hatched. A pheromone trap, that's yeah. very nifty. Well, it wouldn't be springtime in coastal Southern California without fields of ripe strawberries. Mm, look at this one. Okay if I pick one? Yeah, you found a good one there. Go for it. How is it? Delicious. It's good. You know, there's a lot of controversy over growing these. Well, you better believe it. I mean, the, uh, the commercial 
fields in which most straw strawberries are produced in California are um, a situation that creates incredible uh, problems environmentally, socially, personally. Methyl bromide alone, I mean, those fields are all covered with um, plastic at the beginning of the season and under which uh, the fumigant methyl bromide is pumped, which essentially sterilizes, kills everything in the soil. And then, when the plants are planted, they've got to be pumped up again with uh, fertilizers, uh, fertilizers and, and some yeah. 64 different pesticides that are registered for use on Just strawberries. Just because they're growing in essentially sterile soil. That's right, So yeah. you're doing the exact opposite here? Well, we do exactly the opposite. We, instead of sterilizing the soil, we try to build the life in it, and increase the life in it, and make it as uh, well balanced and alive as we can. And as you can see, these plants are very healthy. We also rotate the plantings every year. And you tarp them to, to keep down weeds. We have to put the, we don't like plastic, but we have to use black plastic to uh, keep the weeds down and also the fruit from rotting on the ground. Well, they taste great. You know, Michael, I'm sure most people are used to seeing these spit and polish farms. That's kind of American agriculture. But we're seeing more and more of this kind of weedy look. Or would you even call these weeds? Well, you know, we've kind of uh, established this cultural attitude that uh, a field of vegetables or fruit should only be uh, lines of what we've put in them. And uh, in fact, weeds are uh, very important in terms of providing habitat for beneficial insects, for helping uh, break up soil hard pans, nutrient values. So this is a very important part of the, the whole. This is as important as what you see in the field. Well, Michael, uh, here's a grove of avocados. What are you doing differently here? It doesn't seem like a intensive crop to me. Well, I'll tell you what we're doing differently. Let's stoop down. Let me show you. If you pull these leaves apart, you'll see what's going on here is just like what you'd find in a natural forest. A beautiful buildup of uh, leaf droppings, which are breaking down. You have roots right at the surface. Right. Uh -huh. And very, very rich soils here. So again, and, this is a, the soil conservation story, really. Well, it all, as I was saying, everything that you've seen here on this farm comes down to one thing. The success of everything we do comes down to the health of our soils. And these soils here are incredibly uh, fertile and just full of life. And the fruit from this orchard is really incredible as well. No, you're not kidding. Look at these. They're beautiful. It's quite this, a cluster, isn't it? This yeah. is the variety Haas? This is Haas, yeah. Is it ready to pick? No, we wouldn't pick them this time of year. Really? Yeah. Too low in oil content, very watery. Ah. You, you can certainly buy them like this in the, in the stores, but we're uh, very particular about the, the timing and when we harvest. When do you pick them? In the fall. Well, Michael, you're completely boxed in by tract housing here. You're the only piece of land that hasn't gotten bulldozed. It must be a fascinating story. Now, you're an author and a photographer, and understand you have a book coming out on this, right? That's right. Well, I figured uh, after all the struggles to save this place that we should give other people the opportunity to learn from our successes and our failures, and I um, wrote about this in a book called On Good Land, the Autobiography of an Urban Farm, which... Uh, chronicles our, uh, our story here. So I can learn from your mistakes. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. What about the produce stand over here? Let's take a look at that. Well, Michael, this is a beautiful produce operation. It must take an awful lot of effort. Is it an important part of the uh, farm operation? We feel like it's a very important part. It's worth the effort to provide this to our neighborhood here, and especially in a time and in a world where most of our food travels a very long distance from the field to the plate. We feel it's important to provide a place where people can see the food growing, where they can buy it, where they can teach their children about the context and the interconnections. And so they can make the connection. Absolutely. I yeah. love it. Yeah. I applaud your efforts. Thanks very much. Thanks yeah. for the tour. OK. That was the garden that taught us how to blanch our asparagus with black plastic, as we did earlier this season. Well, we've been so busy this year at the Victory Garden, we've hardly had a chance to show off our cottage garden, which just gets better and better with each passing year. But I promised you some vines. Here at the entrance, our polka rose has recovered from the winter kill that chopped it back to the ground a year ago. 
Our General Sikorsky Clematis is twining up in among the rows, but it's the other side of the driveway that has a real showstopper. It's a hybrid honeysuckle, Lanicera hecrodii, it's called. And what's remarkable about this plant is that it's growing in remarkable shade here on the north side of this small shed. This is just about the most unpromising horticultural location you can think of. And just look at those blooms. Extraordinarily floriferous, hardy, at least to zone four. It belongs in every shady location. Here at the corner of the porch is a post that just cries out for a vine. In the past, we've grown mandevilla here, but we were looking for something that was more permanent and hardy. And so I've chosen another clematis. This is Clematis Madame Julia Coravon. It's a red flowered clematis. The flowers are about four inches across, a little smaller than that big blue General Sikorsky. The plant will grow six to eight feet high. And what I like about it especially is that it is in the so-called type three class in terms of pruning. That is, it can be cut back in April every spring to a height of 12 inches, and the new growth will climb this trellis. It's the clematis variety that blooms on new growth, and I think we'll have the entire post carpeted in gorgeous, bright red blooms. Now, all clematis likes their roots in cool, moist, rich soil, and their tops in the sun. And while I go about planting this, why don't you join Chef Marion? Just about everybody likes green beans, but you know, the standard method of just boiling them can be pretty boring. So today we're going to roast them with two piquant accompaniments, red onion and artichoke hearts. Now all you have to do to the beans are take off the little end and then cut them into about inch, inch and a half bite-sized pieces. And a pound and a quarter will give me about six cups of sliced beans. And to that, I'm going to add the red onion. And all I did here was slice the onions in half and then wedge each half of the onion. I did two onions, and that gives me about four cups of onion slices. And that goes right in with the beans. This is kind of colorful, too, isn't it? Then over this, we put four tablespoons of a very tasty extra virgin olive oil. That's important that it's good olive oil because it's really going to flavor these vegetables. And then I'm going to mix them all up so they're nicely coated before they go into the oven. And I think a little bit of salt. I like this grinding of salt and a good grinding of black pepper. And then one more mix up. And then on to a baking sheet. Spread it out like that. And then I'm going to try to even these out a little bit so they'll cook fairly evenly. And then into a preheated 400 degree oven. These will take 15 to 20 minutes, but I'm going to come back here to add the artichoke in about 15 minutes. Okay, let's see how we're doing here. Oh, this is good. These, see, these beans are getting nice and tender, and so are the onions. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some artichoke hearts. This is about a cup and a half of artichoke hearts that I've cut into quarters. And I'm going to put those right on top and then stir those in. And then I'm just going to let this cook for about, oh, another two minutes until the artichoke hearts are heated through. And then we'll be ready to go on to the next step. I think this is just about ready. Let's see. Ooh, yes. I'll tell you, this smells awfully good. And now, I have to put this all in a great big bowl, like so. There we go. And then I'm going to drizzle over about, oh, two teaspoons of balsamic vinegar. That's a nice, sharp red vinegar, which will Give it a lot of good flavor, sweet flavor, and then some salt and pepper, and this will be ready to serve. What a combination. Beans, onions, and artichokes. Did somebody say beans were boring? Well, you're full of beans, Marion, as always. Now, I've saved the best vine for last, our climbing hydrangea. Hydrangea anomalous pediolaris, a native of Eastern Asia. It is the finest 
climbing, clinging vine in the world, according to Donald Wyman, the former director of the Arnold Arbor Reader, and echoed by none other than Michael Durr himself. What's not to like about this plant? Oh, it's a little slow to get started, but once it does, glorious in bloom, beautiful in leaf, and when the leaves fall off, then you have that lovely bark of the clinging trunk. And it's not hurting its host plant. It's not strangling it. It's just climbing up. Eventually, it'll reach 80 feet in height. Let's make it our plant of the week. Well, that's our show for today. Be sure to join us next time when I get to visit my favorite seed company, Johnny's Selected Seeds. Until then, this is Roger Swain for the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by... At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful. Lawns greener, trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. And by... State Farm Insurance. Keeping our promise of protection to generation after generation. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. A production of WGBH. <laughs> Man, Steve, you're so cool. How did you do that?